Okay, so our speaker uh, today is Brendan Shapiro of Cornell University. And uh, one thing that uh, you may want to know about Brendan is that his email address and Gmail has hardly, to, hardly anything to do with his uh, name. And uh, I was puzzled by that for a while. And then I realized that if you went for something like bshapiro at gmail.com, he would probably be receiving a lot of emails from empowered uh, young white men uh, for reasons that, uh, oh, this is just some right wing. <laughs> Uh, I hadn't activist. thought of that. Uh, uh, yeah, so. Uh, well, I guess I've avoided the storm. Yeah. So, so I think you you may have wisely avoided that without realizing. But okay, I'll hand it over to Brandon, who will speak about constructing cubes from semi cubes. All right. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, first of all, let's see. All right. Everybody can see the full screen. Is that working all right? Yep, perfect. Okay, great. I'm a little bit hesitant about the technology here. There were some glitches last night, but I think I've gotten to somewhere that it'll work okay. Um, and I can't see you guys, so if you have any questions, shout at me or have somebody else shout at me, whatever's more convenient. So I called this talk Constructing Cubes from Semi-Cubes, and I'll tell you what that means in a minute. But first, I want to start off with some vague notation. Um, now, I'm hoping this is kind of consistent with what other people are using. Um, what I'm going to do is, in a cube category or semi-cube category, the face maps are going to be written by del. Um, so del n i epsilon goes into the n cube from the n minus 1 cube. Um, and it sends the ith, it skips the ith dimension and sends it to either zero or one, which is epsilon. And then likewise for degeneracies or sigma, connections are gamma, symmetries tau, reversals rho, diagonals delta. And in this talk, primarily, most of those will only be relevant for the next convention I'm gonna use, which is hopefully not too offensive, but I'm gonna, right, box A, um, where A is going to be some subset of these, um, often A will be just del for the semi-cube category, and that's going to be the cube category that has all of those structure maps. And if you see any bits of notation that you're confused about or angry about, let me know, and I will clarify. And then more common notation. C hat, um, or C is always going to be one of these cube categories, is just pre-sheaves on C. And so when I say constructing cubes from semi-cubes, what I mean is I'm going to show you how each category of cubical sets, for all of these A's, is, can be expressed as the category of algebras for a monad on semi-cubical sets, um, where box of del is the semi-cube category, only the face maps. And the reason I was interested in presenting this um, was in part because it's an example of a more general construction, which I'll get into a little bit at the end, that I've been working on in my research, but also I think it's a nice way of walking through the structure of these different cube categories and seeing different ways of building them up. Um, and hopefully at the end, I'll have time to talk a little bit about why a lot of these operations can be seen as, shouldn't say natural, canonical maybe, um, from a certain perspective. So, and we're also going to be able to construct all of these cube categories, box A, um, from these monads, which I think is really neat. So, moving along. First, I want to just quickly review my definition of the semi-cube category. 
So it's going to be defined as the free monoidal category generated by two maps, um, which I'm going to call del zero and del one, though I wrote them with these extra one ones, um, so they're consistent with the rest of the indexing um, from the identity, which is zero cube, to the generator, which is the one cube. And what that is going to look like in full. Oh no, I forgot to do the order thing. Sorry about that. What that's going to look like in general is this category where, not yet. So when we take the free strict monoidal category on this information, so I wrote free in quotes because it is free on um, this pointed category. The, the unit object is predetermined. Um, we get box n for all n, which is just the n-fold monoidal product of our generator, box one. And we get a bunch more face maps. Um, there's going to be two n of them from each into each n from n minus one. And I'll describe the notation we use in a second. So first of all, uh, we're going to visualize these as usual as n-dimensional cubes. Box one should be thought of as the interval where del zero and del one are the source and target. And then we have source and target faces in each dimension. So here there are two, here there are three, and I'm going to order the dimensions like this, first down, then over, then in, um, mostly because I drew the pictures that way before I had thought about it enough. And our generating face maps in the usual sense come from tensor products of a single source or target inclusion, this del epsilon in the ith dimension, surrounded by identities on the interval on either side. So if we look at this one here, which is del 2, 2, 0, um, in the two dimension, which is horizontally, it's a source, that's why epsilon is 0, and in all of the others, namely just the one direction, it's the identity. It looks like the full interval. Um, can you guys see my uh, mouse pointer moving around? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, great. That makes life a lot easier. So that's the semi cube category. It's the same as Chris defined it yesterday. And so now I'll talk about our monad adding degeneracies, which is what it's going to do is take a semi cubical set and add in extra cubes which we're going to think of as degenerate, adding in higher dimensional cubes from, which are degenerated from lower dimensional ones. But first, I want to talk a little bit about how the maps in the semi-cube category behave when you pick out specific dimensions. So I'll write del without any indices for a general map in the semi-cube category, um, in this case, from the m cube to the n cube. And a del is going to be the subset of 1 through n containing the components um, of the n cube on which del is the identity. So when all of our maps can be written as a monoidal product of identities, sources, and targets, a del is going to be the set of those, um, these indices, on which it's the identity. So to give an example, If del is this map, which is the full interval on components one, three, and six, source in components two and five, and a target in component four, then a del is going to be one, three, six. And you'll note that this is a map 
from the three cube to the six cube, and A del is gonna have the same size as the dimension of the domain because we have three different dimensions in the domain that we can send into the codomain. So A del set tells us which of them they go to and then sort of forgets whether it goes into the source of the target in the other ones. So, yep, I wrote that down. So generally speaking, in this situation, A del is gonna have size M. And there's a canonical isomorphism between the two that preserves the order inherited from one through N, which will become relevant in a minute. But we're also gonna be interested in picking out from the codomain a particular subset of those dimensions and restricting this map del to how it behaves just on those dimensions. But it's not entirely clear what that means because I've only restricted to dimensions in the codomain. So what we're gonna wanna do is have a canonical way of also restricting the domain. And in particular, that's just gonna be taking the intersection of this given set A of dimensions in the N cube, take the intersection with A del, and we can actually restrict this map to those cubes, which I'll show you how. So first of all, just to get a sense of it, if we restrict to the one, two, and four dimensions, then A, the intersection with A del, which is one, three, and six, is just gonna be one. And what we see down here is if we just ignore the other dimensions, we just take the one, two, and four components of this map, that gives us a map in our semi-cube category. It's a noidal product of these generating maps. And it goes from the one cube to the three cube, which we know because only one of the components is the identity. So if we were to draw this, it would look like the source in the second dimension and the target in the third dimension and then the identity in the first. So that would look like, sorry if I'm covering up the camera, trying to get the pen to work. Here, come on, I can find the thing. Wait, so is something happening or? No, nothing's happening. My pen's not okay. working. I'm not sure why. Ah, okay. Okay, uh, I, was, I wasn't sure what the... That is unfortunate, if true. Um, one second. If I can't get this to work, then I'll just move on. If, about if it. it's an Apple Pencil, what happened to me when it stopped working was you had to screw in the nib. Interesting. I've done this before. Um, let me try one thing. No pen. Okay. Well. Well, I'll see if I can get that to work later, maybe. In the meantime, um, can I draw with my mouse? Uh, let's see. If I, nope, doesn't seem like it. So, okay, well, sorry about that. This was not a technical difficulty I anticipated. But anywho, the idea of this map, if you're thinking of the cube, this would send the interval into the top, or rather the back left vertical one. Um, oh, hey, pen. Okay, great. So I can draw three cube. And this map goes 
into that one, um, where everything is pointing down, left, and back. The other cubes have arrows drawn in, so that will be easier to see. And what we're going to do then is give this intersection a name and, ex and talk about how these subsets of one through n are functorial in the semi-cube category in the sense that if we have some subset A of one through n and a map del from the m cube to the n cube, we can pull it back to get a subset, um, which I'll write B A delta, or del, which is just this intersection of the set one through M. So that's gonna be useful for defining our monad. So we're gonna start with a semi-cubical set X. I'm gonna use the hopefully inoffensive convention of writing D as opposed to del for the corresponding structure map in X. And I'm gonna write for any subset A of one through N, XA is gonna be X, um, the component of X of the size of A. So if A has size three, then XA is the three cubes. And now let's define our endofunctor. So the endofunctor is going to be called T sigma, um, where sigma means that we're adding in the usual degeneracies. And the n cubes of T sigma x are going to be the disjoint union over all subsets of 1 through n, xa. So we're taking all subsets of dimensions and adding in an additional n cube for each a cube, so to speak, um, which is, as we'll see, precisely what degeneracies look like. And then how do we make this functorial for any map del from the m cube to the n cube in our semi cube category, um, the corresponding d which goes from T sigma XN to T sigma XM is defined on each component by the structure map for, oops, got ahead of myself, by the structure map for D sub A. So this is why we were talking about this above and how we want to be able to pull back a map del to del A from this subset. So Brandon? Yeah. Uh, this is Muriel speaking. I have, a, I have a question. Can I interrupt? Yes, of course. Um, so the, the category, which is the one with only faces, delta of Q, yes. um, if you... So I wondered if there's just a, um, you, you would like to, to have an adjoint, an, a, an adjunction between the uh, semi-cubical and any cubical category, and this adjunction is monadic? Yes, that is ultimately what we're building up to. Okay, cubical so in sets. some sense you are building um, like a left adjoint um, to kind of forgetful frontier from uh, cubical uh, sets to semi-cubical sets? Yes. Okay. Thank yes, that's one way of seeing this. Um, so, oh yeah, I didn't draw that at the beginning, but as, as you pointed out, um, every category of cubical sets has a forgetful functor to semi-cubical sets induced by the inclusion of the semi-cube category into whichever cube category you're working with. And these monads that I'm building, um, the the, the adjunction you get between the semi-cubical sets and eilenberg more algebras for this monad are going to agree with um, the forgetful functor from the algebras, which are going to agree with cubical sets, is going to be the same forgetful functor. 
So one way of seeing this is, yes, this is going to give a left adjoint to that forgetful functor. But one of the reasons I like this construction so much is that even if you didn't know anything about cubicle sets um, you know, with all of these degeneracies and other structures, this is going to give us a way of defining those from, I guess, a different presentation of the data of degeneracies. Um, so here I'm doing in detail the example where we add in the usual degeneracies and we'll see that you can do a similar, you can construct a similar monad for all of the others. So in this case, so I mentioned, right, we define the structure map D restricting to each component of this disjoint union using the restriction to the dimensions A of the map del that I described up here, where you just forget all of the components outside of A. X is a functor, a contravariant functor from the semi-cube category to sets, so it has a structure map for each of those um, del sub A's. So this gives us an endofunctor from semi-cubical sets to semi-cubical sets, and we want it to be a monad. So, before I tell you that, do a quick example of what this looks like. So in the representable semi-cubical set on the two cube, uh, which looks just like this. We have four vertices. We have four edges arranged as such, and one, one square in X2. Applying this endofunctor, the vertices stay the same. We add in a new vert edge, the degenerate edge at each vertex, and we add in a bunch of degenerate cubes. So one at each vertex, and two at each edge, um, indicated by these two copies of the set of edges. And what these cubes are gonna look like is the usual degeneracies, where for the vertex we have all degenerate edges. Um, the, these two are given by making the two different directions degenerate, and of course, we keep the original cube. Um, and so this is gonna look like, as you pointed out, the representable two cube in cubical sets as opposed to semi-cubical sets. And then moving on, now we define the unit where this disjoint union ranges over subsets of one through N, but if we just take the entire thing, one through n, we just get xn in the first place. So that lets us define this unit map. Every T sigma xn contains the original xn, and in fact, only once. And by all means, stop me if I'm going too fast. Now, I'm not going to write out entirely what multiple, how to derive multiplication for this monad. Um, but in essence, it involves, if you have a subset of one through N, that subset is gonna have size M. And if you furthermore have another subset of that, this composes into a subset of one through N given by B, where this isomorphism is again, the one determined by the order on A. So that gives us our monad. And algebras are going to be exactly what we want them to be. So because T sigma x n in ranges over all subsets of 1 through n, and for each of them adds a copy of x a, this algebra map is going to restrict to a map from xA to xN for all n and a subset of 1 through n. And I'm going to suggestively call those SA. 
And these maps have the following properties. So, respecting the unit of the monad um, means that if we go from x1 through n to xn, that that's just going to be the identity. So we don't want this structure map to be non-trivial. This is how we know that the copy of x in t sigma x is really behaves like x, and algebras should respect that. Then preserving multiplication means that when we have an arrangement of subsets like this, where b is a subset of 1 through m, a is an m-like subset of 1 through n, then the composition of sb and sa, along with the canonical isomorphism xn to xa, that this agrees with the algebra structure map sb into xn given by this subset inclusion. And in a minute, I'll work out more concretely what that means. And then lastly, we need to make sure that this algebra map from T sigma X to X is natural, that, that it's actually, uh, well, certainly natural in X, but also an actual map of semi-cubical sets. And that's going to work out to this commutativity square, where if we have one of these structure maps from xa to n, and then we look at a map in the semi-cube category corresponding to the structure map d, xn to xm, then we want the corresponding um, SBA del from this restricted subset of A, A restricted along the map del to XM. We want that to commute with the restriction of the map in semi cube category. And again, in a second, I'll show more concretely what this means. Idea being that the monad structure severely restricts what these algebra, what these components of the algebra structure map can be. So that we can then generate them by, oops, uh, I went too far. So by property two, we know how to compose these, that these compositions of these compose into, uh, these S maps compose into another S map. So it suffice, and that the top level one is the identity. So it suffices to restrict to S of this subset, which omits just one element of one through N, namely I, and that's gonna be a map from XN minus one to XN. And now I'll just state briefly that we actually get the cubical identities from these properties. So property two tells us that both of these composites give the same degeneracy map, in particular, the one omitting I and J plus one. I really hope I have that indexing right. I think I do. Um, these two, both of these maps omit one vertex um, in the resulting subset, you, the resulting subsets of Xn given by these composites are the same, namely this, and so they're equal by algebras respecting multiplication of the monad. And then property three tells us how they behave with respect to face maps. And these identities, which are the classical cubical identities, arise from just unwinding um, B A del and D sub A for all of the relevant maps. Um, 
it works out this way. And therefore, these S maps that we get from an algebra structure on X endow X with the structure of a classical cubicle set. And in fact, the data of an algebra structure on X is the same as the data of a cubicle set structure on X, because if we have SIN that satisfy these properties, then they're going to satisfy these properties up here and vice versa, which gives us the first example of the result I wrote at the beginning. And so even without knowing, even if we didn't know what the ordinary cube category was, we could build this monad on semi-cubical sets and define cubical sets as algebras for this moment, if we had reason to do that, which I guess depends on your mood. I'm trying to think of some reasons. But we also want to be able to extract from this description of cubical sets the cube category. And that's going to be the full subcategory of T sigma algebras spanned by the T sigma applied to the representable semi cubical sets. And I'll quickly show you where the maps come from. So first of all, before doing that, this subcategory certainly has all of the face maps just by applying T sigma to a face map between M cubes. But we also want to get the degeneracy maps between them. And to give an example, we can use this adjunction between T sigma algebras and semi cubical sets, and the fact that a map from the one cube into T sigma of the zero cube is given just by a one cube in T sigma of the zero cube. And in fact, T sigma of the zero cube has a single cube in all dimensions, namely the degenerate one on the point zero cube. And so this map, picking that out, gets transported to a map from T sigma of the one cube to T sigma of the zero cube, which didn't exist in the semi cube category. But when we embed the semi cube category into T sigma algebras like this, we get extra maps um, like this. So before I move on to the more general construction, uh, I want to pause for any questions about this so far. I have a question, Brandon. Yeah. Um, is there something like this for simplicial sets and semi-simplicial sets? Yes. OK. Yes, there is. That's and that, that, that's the question. I mean, you could, you could say more if you want, but, but thank you. Yeah, the, so I'm going to describe a general construction um, of how we do this kind of thing. That's the next thing. And if we replaced the semi-cube category with the semi-simplex category, you can do the exact same thing, adding in degeneracies. There's a fairly nice description of it. And that, actually, that, that, that monad actually arises. Um, in a number of interesting ways that I think are really cool. So yes. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, uh, so the, the, this forgetful functor from the bigger cube, cubicle set category to a smaller one is it's both monadic and co-monadic. Do you have a similar description for the co-monad? Co-monadic. Um, That is not something I'm familiar with. 
so I don't, but I would be interested in thinking about that. I, yeah. Oh yeah, so because the functor has both left and right adjoints. So by the by the uh, monodicity theorem, you just have to check that it's conservative to see that it's both monadic and co-monadic. And uh, it follows from the map the functor on sites being essentially subjective, right? Mm -hmm. I suspect that. So this is rank conjecture, but if I had to guess, I would say that similar data probably could be used to describe something like that. Okay. Because ultimately, the data that went into describing this amounts to an embedding of the semi-cube category into the cube category, which determines both of those adjoints. So I imagine you could get something like that. But I, I haven't thought about it before. Okay, so I'm gonna go on then and talk about how this kind of construction works. Um, so I'm gonna abstract away what exactly we used to define this monad. So first of all, most importantly, were the subsets of one through N, which played a very central role in this. And I'm going to name the set of such subsets, um, a curly A N. Um, so the first thing we need in defining a monad like this is a set curly A N for all N. And furthermore, whenever we had a map in the semi-cube category, the assignment of A to the intersection of A with del A, the A del, amounts to a function from A n to A n. Then we also had, for every subset A, we assigned it to the cube of dimension the size of A, and we also assigned for every pair of a map in the semi-cube category and a subset A of one through N, this map del sub A um, between these cubes. So we can essentially, um, well, I'll describe it in a second. You can think of this as sort of like a vibrational property, but that's not how I'm gonna phrase it. So this was what it took to define the endofunctor. And then on top of that, we also had the unit and multiplication, where the unit came from having a particularly nice element of a n, namely this full set one through n. A multiplication came from, I use this word vaguely, composition of subsets in this sense. So that can be made a little bit more concise in the following way. So curly A is a functor from semi-cube category up to set, um, which sends the n cube to the set of subsets of one through n and acts on maps accordingly in the opposite direction. Now, you might be asking why I don't just call A a semi-cubical set, which it certainly is, but in this case, A is meant more to serve as an index for the different operations that we're adding, uh, where each of these subsets, A, I'll call an operation. And we're never really gonna think about it geometrically. So I'll refrain from calling it a semi-cubical set. Then the third bullet point assembles into a functor from the category of elements of A into the semi-cube category, where the category of elements of A has um, category of elements of A has objects, um, these elements A, 
and maps from B A del to A for each pair A and del. So these maps here, del sub A, essentially amount to the action of F on morphisms. And there's an example lower down. So even if my pen stops working, that hopefully won't be a problem. And then the unit data can be described as a map from the terminal semi-cubical set, which I'll write as star, into A. So the terminal semi-cubical set has a single, has a single cube in each dimension. And so E amounts to a choice of a distinguished element in each AN, just like we had here. And we also had that this assignment sends this to the N cube. And so we can describe that like this, where category of elements of the terminal semi-cubical set is just the semi-cube category that maps to the category of elements of A, and then back to the semi-cube category, and we want that to be the identity. The distinguished element of each AN goes to the N cube. And then something to do with multiplication that I don't have time to talk about, but again, can be written out more formally. So given that, you can define an endofunctor in exactly the same way where TXN is the disjoint union over the operations A and AN and disjoint union of different components of the functor X, namely each operation A and AN adds a copy of X FA to TXN. So for each degeneracy, we add a copy of, so if we have a degeneracy from the one cube to the three cube, then we add a degenerate three cube for each one cube is the idea. And um, this data suffices to make that functorial. E amounts to a unit operation. Multiplication data does the same and you impose the monad laws at that level. Then quickly before I go back to examples, um, We actually didn't need to specify all of the information we did for T sigma, because all it really came from was adding the operation sigma, which is adding a one cube for every zero cube, and assuming that the operations are closed under monoidal product. So Chris mentioned last time that cubicle sets have a, actually, before I mention that. The idea here, E0 and E1 are meant to be the unit elements. So those were the full subsets in the previous description of T sigma. This sigma here is gonna be the empty subset of the set one. And what that corresponds to in cubes is we take the category of elements of this, um, this is a fragment of it, but it's the important part. Um, it just looks like the semi-cube category among the unit elements. And down here, we have to decide what are the source and target of sigma. In this case, we only have one choice, unit. And then we map that by F back to the semi-cube category, which amounts to choosing what the degeneracy is going to look like. So, a describes how many degeneracies we have, how they relate to each other. F describes how degenerate they are. What do they degenerate from? And in the case of sigma, it's the zero cube with source and target just identity, the same zero cube. And this determines um, the relations that we got above. And then everything else is monoidally generated um, from this. And while I certainly don't have time to talk about that in detail, um, the essence of it is that if you just start with all of the units, you add in sigma and describe how F 
acts on stigma and then acts into it, then you can take a free monoid with respect to the day convolution model structure, monoidal structure on semi-cubical sets generated by the pointed semi-cubical set A. And this is gonna give the same thing we saw before with the subsets where AN is gonna contain elements that look like this, some copy of the unit tensored with some copies of sigma and the subset is again, just like before, gonna be the subset of these components that are E1, um, that are the identity corresponding to which dimensions in our degenerate cube are non-degenerate. So, having done that, I want to talk a little bit about how we, what this kind of construction looks like for all of the other kinds of cubes. Now, I don't want to go over time, um, especially since it would be myself that I'm cutting short in the second talk. But I'll spend a little bit of time talking about connections. Where do connections go? Okay, well, I'm going to find connections. It should be in here. Okay, here we go. I should be able to raise the. All right, great. So instead of describing the entire monad for connections, like I did in the case of degeneracies, which is possible, but would be kind of rather difficult, take a long time. And there are descriptions, but I don't think they're nearly as nice. We can talk about monoidally generating it in the same sense as I described for the usual degeneracies. So this time, we have the same things in A0 and A1. So we keep, we keep the usual zero cubes, the usual one cubes, add in a degenerate one cube for each zero cube, that's sigma. Keep the usual two cubes, but also add in a degenerate two cube for each one cube. So I'm only gonna do one of the connections here, but the other one is gonna work the same way. And what that's gonna look like is, so first of all, what does the category of elements look like for this? Looks the same on, in dimension zero and one. In dimension two, we have to say, what are the different sources and targets of this degenerate square that we're adding? And that square is gonna look like this one over here. Is that gamma one or gamma, is it gamma zero? Well, I wrote gamma one, so. I'm gonna go with that, but if that's wrong, I apologize. And this has source edges in both dimensions be just a usual one, one cube and targets are degenerate, which is why in this category of elements, we see that the target faces um, where epsilon is one, come from the degenerate one cube that we draw like this and the source faces which come from an actual one cube are the usual ones from e1 and f then maps that into the semi cube category again the same in dimension zero and one sigma is still a degenerate one simplex on a zero simplex and gamma that's a plus, it's supposed to be a one. My pen doesn't work, so I can't fix it. Is sent to the one cube with the maps. So where the, the source faces in both dimensions are just the identity, the same one cube, and the targets are both the target zero cube of that one cube. And it's really nice to be able to talk about monoidally generating things from this. 
because it saves us from having to write out all of the other all of the other maps you could say that all of the degeneracy operations we get from this are just tensor products of some sigmas some gamma ones and some identities except that wouldn't actually give us what we want and this is probably a good enough place to conclude where when we do that, we get all of these generating degeneracies and connections, the ones that go from Xn minus one to Xn, where we just take a single degeneracy or connection and tensor it with the identity on all sides um, where the E's are meant to describe that. But this doesn't actually tell us when we run the machine, get the monad and build the corresponding cube category. This doesn't tell us how those are supposed to compose. And we were lucky in the case of degeneracies that when you do that, the compositions are just obvious. There's only one choice really for what they can be and you just set it to be that. In this case, we actually don't have all of the operations we need. For instance, if you compose two connections like this in either of these two ways, which is not something we have in this structure yet, then what you're meant, what you're supposed to be describing is a cube that looks like this, where you've taken the connection in both dimensions, or all three dimensions generated by two of them in these maps. And this is not something that we get by just starting with one connection and extending to monoidal products. This is something we have to actually add in either by hand or by a different kind of generation operation. In particular, this gets back to how we define multiplication in the model. And it turns out that on this category of pairs A and F, um, which I would write down if I could with my pen, we actually have two different monoidal structures. One that comes from deconvolution from the monoidal structure on semi cube category, and one that comes from this multiplicative structure giving the multiplication of the monad that eventually will tell us when we build the corresponding cube category, how to compose these different operations when it's not entirely clear how they should be composed. And I think I'll end it there just with one last comment that you can actually do symmetries, reversals, and diagonals in the same way, where reversals come from just adding a swapping degeneracy in A1, and exchanges come from adding a swap in A2. Um, diagonals, you add something to A2 coming from a one cube. But I think for the sake of time, I'll stop now. Thank you. All right, thanks, Brendan. So let's thank Brendan for, for the talk. Uh, we're doing Simon the Pause, I think. Uh, or, yeah. Um, okay, and uh, maybe let's have a couple of short questions uh, or uh, long questions uh, or questions uh, or comments. So let me answer the microphone and ask a question. and. Or write it in chat or um, okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'll have one more call for um, questions. Maybe I'll make a comment. Uh, 
but it's 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 kind of offensive. So I don't know if I should. Uh, but my uh, offensive comment is that I never really liked the semi cube category. Mm. Um, so to me, like the reason why the semi simplex category works is that uh, even though the point is not the terminal object anymore, it is weakly equivalent to it, right? Because mm -hmm. if you think about the semi simplicial set that has one thing in each dimension, then what you're saying is I have one point, I have a loop on that point, but then the triangle tells you that the uh, that this loop, let's call it F, F squared is uh, uh, homotopic to F. And if you keep going, it kind of tells you that like F is really null homotopic. Now, when you look at the category of semi-cubical sets, um, you know, the, the terminal object is no longer uh, contractible because uh, now you get a point, you get a loop, but then inside of uh, uh, the square tells you that F squared is equal to F squared. Sure, great, but that's not exactly what being no homotopic means. So I'm just, uh, yeah. The, yeah. I know. <laughs> that was well, my really insult. I really like that comment um, and don't take it as an insult because. Oh, it's not an insult to you. It's an insult to semi cube kind of you. So. Right. So <laughs> maybe, I'll, maybe I'll phrase it as countering that insult. I think while I agree with you, the semi cube category is not certainly not as good as cubes if we're trying to describe spaces. But I, th and that's something I'll talk about in the next talk. But I find this distinction really meaningful because the semi cube category is sort of the purest description of the geometric data of the cubes, um, analogous to the globe category. Um, where we don't add any degeneracies. Globular sets are certainly not sufficient to do homotopy theory, but they describe basic data. And the, when we add in degeneracies, that is adding the extra information that we need to do spaces, which is part of why I like constructions like this. And this perspective gets more clear, I think, um, as a plug for my talk next week on cubical higher categories, where you can actually do with semi-cubes the same things you can do with globes, where you add in composites of them and you add in identities, um, which are namely these degeneracies. And something that's really interesting to me is that unlike in globes where in order to be able to do homotopy theory, you really need to add in both identities and composites. You need a rich algebraic structure on those things. Like the globe category with identities um, isn't sufficient for homotopy theory, but the theta category where you've also added in composites is. With semi-cubes, you can actually do a lot of homotopy theory only with degeneracies. And I find that really neat. And you see the same picture with simple Cs, where if you start with just the data of an interval with you know, a source and a target endpoint, you get the simplex category by adding in degeneracies and composites. So the higher simple Cs are like composites of those intervals. And you need both the, the, the composite, well, you need the composites more um, because the semi-simplex category you can actually do a lot with, but you need the composites. Um, the degeneracies make it nicer. In semi-cubes, you can get away with a lot using only degeneracies without any sort of composites. And to me, I find that really neat. That, like the semi-cubes are actually a very rich shape that can do a lot without adding in fancy compositional structure. All right, um, anyone else? Um. Hi, I've got a very general sort of question. So here, I don't know if maybe I'm encroaching on a topic of a later talk, I'm not sure, but it looks like your 
splitting sort of the cube category into the like the positive and negative parts of its reedy structure with these faces and degeneracies. So is there like a general setup where if I have a reedy category, I don't know what, whether reedy category is the right assumption or whether it should be in Islandberg Zilber category or what. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a general framework to think about this kind of construction? Um, and if so, does it also give you like a, a new way to think about whatever kind of category uh, is required for as to be the input to that construction, like a reedy category? That's a really good question and something I may spend some time trying to answer. So what I've thought about before mm -hmm. is the perspective I usually take is that the, the degree raising maps in a reedy category are a direct category. Right. And something I've thought about um, is that if you start with a direct category and use this mechanism to add degeneracies to it, you should get something like a reedy category, maybe with some conditions on what those degeneracies look like to make sure you have the right factorizations. That's something I haven't proven, but have long suspected and hope to write down at some point. But I think it would be very interesting if like, furthermore, you could actually recover a reedy category, given any reedy category, could you recover it by going to the, the direct category of degree raising maps and then adding everything back in some way. I think that would be really cool, uh, but I don't. I, I okay, yeah, it. thanks. That, that agrees with sort of my understanding as well, or the, and also the limited nature of my own understanding. But it seems to recur in these different situations, like with some visual sets. So I don't know what the right generalization is yet. Yeah, those are those are examples where like I know it works. Like I mentioned before, that, that there's a monad for um, there's a monad on semi-simplicial sets whose algebras are simplicial sets, which is described similarly to this. Um, I would hope that it's true in general. That would be nice. Um, but I think most of the most of the reedy categories I care about are ones where I've already kind of verified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it for sure in general. Thanks.